This is the Epix Generation 2. It's Garmin's 2022 top of the line active smartwatch. However, is it worth the $900 or more you'll have to pay to own one? Well, we'll test that from a health tracking perspective in this video. We'll take a look at the quality of its sleep tracking, heart rate monitoring, oxygen saturation measurements, and GPS tracking. We'll also compare these measurements to those of the Garmin Fenix 7 I wore at the same time, but on the other arm. Last week, I tested the performance of the Garmin Vivomove Sport, which out of all the Garmin watches I've tested so far, seems to have the best sleep stage tracking. Like most new Garmin watches, the Epix 2 also has advanced sleep stage monitoring, which tracks your sleep stages, oxygen saturation of the blood, and breathing rate. Can the more expensive Epix 2 match the performance of the Vivomove Sport? To check if the Epix 2 can detect my sleep stages, I'll compare it to an EEG device called the Dream 2 that can actually measure my brain waves and has been shown to be relatively reliable at sleep stage tracking. Here I show an overview of the sleep test results. For getting an overall impression for how well the Epix 2 performs, the Dream 2 should likely be good enough. However, the gold standard would be polysomnography, which I would also like to try on the Epix 2 in the future. Now on top are the sleep stages as recorded by the EEG device and on the left are the sleep stages as recorded by the Epix. I wore both the EEG device and the Epix 2 to bed for 4 nights and I'll see how close the predictions of the Epix 2 are to those of the EEG device. Each column sums to 100%, meaning that we can see what percentage of each of the sleep stages according to the Dream 2 EEG headband was predicted as each sleep stage by the Epix 2. If they perfectly agree, all values on the diagonal should be 100%. First of all, we see that only about 24% of what was deep sleep according to the EEG device was also deep sleep according to the Epix 2. Most of what the EEG device identified as being deep sleep was actually detected by the Epix 2 as being light sleep. This discrepancy is mostly due to the fact that the Garmin Epix 2 detected very little deep sleep. We can see that by looking at the individual nights, like this example night right here. On top we have the sleep stage according to the Dream 2 EEG headband, with the clock time along the horizontal axis and the sleep stage on the vertical axis. On the bottom we have a similar plot, but now for the Epix 2. I've highlighted all the EEG recorded deep sleep in purple here, and as you can see, what the Epix 2 marked as deep sleep was also marked as deep sleep by the EEG, however in general very little deep sleep was detected. That's also what we see for this second night. In general, very little deep sleep is detected. Light sleep agreed okay-ish with the EEG device at about 61%. If they did disagree, this was mostly by the Epix 2 predicting REM sleep. REM sleep also did not agree very well between the EEG device and the Epix 2. Only 42% of what the EEG device marked as REM sleep was also marked as REM sleep by the Epix 2. A larger percentage was actually classified as light sleep by the Epix 2. That's also confirmed by looking at the individual nights. In red I marked the REM sleep as recorded with the EEG device, and as you can see there's only marginal agreement between both devices. You go through roughly 4-6 to six sleep cycles each night, each one starting with light sleep and deep sleep, which is marked here in blue for the EEG device, and each one ending in REM sleep, marked here in red for the EEG device. As you can see, I likely had 1, 2, 3, 4 complete sleep cycles this night. And because the REM sleep detection by the Epix 2 does not seem that great, I would judge we cannot see the sleep cycles based on just the data from the Epix 2. Awake detection did show relatively high agreement with EEG device at over 80%. If the Epix 2 did classify awake time as something else than the EEG device, this was mostly as light sleep and REM sleep. As you can see here in green, the longer awakenings according to the EEG device did indeed match with the Epix 2, though the Epix 2 also detected some extra awake moments. And we mostly see the same thing for this night right here. There's a partial match, but also some extra awake time is detected by the Epix 2. For those of you that watched my video on the Garmin Phoenix 7, these results might look somewhat familiar. The Phoenix 7 also did not seem to be very good at sleep stage tracking. The similarity between the Epix 2 and Phoenix 7 makes sense, given that the design and sensors of these devices are identical for the most part and they mainly differ in their screen types. Now while I was wearing the Epix 2 on my right arm I was also wearing the Phoenix 7 on my left. This gives us the opportunity to check how similar the sleep tracking of the Epix 2 and Phoenix 7 actually is. First let's see what percentages of each of the sleep stages both watches predicted. Interestingly, the Epix 2 predicted the way less deep sleep than the Phoenix 7. The Epix 2 only detected about 5% deep sleep throughout the 4 nights, whereas the Phoenix 7 predicted about 11%, which is still not a lot. The percentages of light sleep are roughly in the same ballpark, at a little over 60%. The Epix 2 did detect a bit more REM sleep and awake time than the Phoenix 7. However, how similar are the sleep stage predictions of these watches over the night? Well, that's displayed here. Here we see for each of the four sleep stages predicted by the Epix 2 if the Phoenix 7 agreed with it. Let me explain what I mean. 
For instance, this 89.4% here means that about 89% of what was marked as deep sleep by the Apex 2 was also marked as deep sleep by the Phoenix 7. And we can of course make the same plot using the Phoenix 7 sleep stages as the starting point. Now we see that only about a third of the deep sleep detected by the Phoenix 7 was also marked as deep sleep by the Apex 2. Now this is linked to what we saw before, which is that the Phoenix 7 detected more than double the deep sleep of the Apex 2. Light sleep in both cases showed moderate agreement between both devices at about 75%. REM sleep also shows moderate agreement at best with an overlap of 53 and 68%. And finally, awake time overlaps pretty poorly between both devices, with a maximum of 36% in both these matrices. Okay, those were a lot of numbers, but what did it mean? Well, I suspect that the differences between the sleep tracking of the Phoenix 7 and Apex 2 is not due to the devices being different. I think it's more likely due to a lack of robustness in the algorithm. Now, both devices were always running the same firmware version, so they were likely using the same algorithm. However, the devices got slightly different inputs because I wore them on different arms, and the slightly different heart rates and movement measured were enough to result in vast differences in the sleep tracking of both devices. Assuming this is the case, this implies that the algorithm used by Garmin on these watches should be improved. At least that's my hypothesis. If you have any other ideas, please let us know in the comments below. I still do not understand why the Garmin of Vivamoo Sport seems to do so much better no matter which arm I wore it on. This graph shows an overview of the agreement of different watches with the EEG device, with the Vivamoo Sport right here. Along the horizontal axis we have the average agreement over the four individual individual sleep stages and on the vertical axis we have the agreement of the worst sleep stage. The better the agreement with the EEG device the more to the top right the device is. As you can see the best agreeing devices include different Fitbits, in this case the Fitbit Sense Inspire 2 and Charge 5, the Whoopstrap 3.0, 4.0 and the Withing Sleep Analyzer. As you can see the Phoenix 7, Venue 2 and Venue 2 Plus do not have a high level of agreement with the EEG device. However the Garmin Vivo Move Sport does quite well. If we now plot the Apex 2 in the same plot, we see that this is quite close to the test results I got for my original Phoenix 7 test. Both have an average agreement over the four stages of about 50%. Interestingly, if we now also plot the new results for the Phoenix 7 right here, and with new results I mean for the same nights I tested the Apex 2, we see that this agrees slightly better than the previous testing, with an average agreement of about 57%. It mostly shows up as better in this graph because none of the sleep stages have a very large disagreement, meaning that it's higher on the vertical axis. I suspect however that this marginally better agreement is due to some random variation and a relatively low number of nights tested, but future testing will have to show if this is the case or not. Overall though, the sleep stage tracking of both the Epix 2 and Phoenix 7 does not appear to be very good. However, some people might value the simple metric of the sleep score more than the detailed sleep stages. So how similar are these between both devices? That is displayed in this table right here. In total, I slept with both devices for five nights. And as you can see, there were quite some differences in the sleep scores I got for both devices. The fifth day, for instance, the Epix 2 gave me a score of 73, whereas the Phoenix 7 gave me a score of 88. Most nights, the Phoenix 7 actually gave me a higher score. I suspect that this might be due to the larger percentage of deep sleep predicted by the Phoenix 7. Only the first day, the Phoenix 7 gave me a lower sleep score. However, this night, it said it could not detect my sleep for part of the night, so that's probably the reason. So I left this night out of all the other analysis I showed you so far. Next, let's move on to heart rate tracking. However, as you might have noticed, my reviews of Garmin watches came out a lot later than that of most reviewers. That is because Garmin did not let me the watches to review before they were launched, and I have to buy all the watches myself. If you want to help the channel get noticed by Garmin, a sub to the channel and pressing like on this video would really go a long way, and it will also help me get these videos out faster. But of course, it's totally up to you. Now, we previously saw that the heart rate tracking of the Phoenix 7 was decent, though not great. What about the Epix 2? Let's take a look at the results during spinning, cycling and weightlifting. In the next tests, I'll compare the heart rate measurements of the Epix 2 against the Polar H10 ECG chest strap, which can generally record my heart rate very accurately. We'll start by looking at the easiest type of exercise for a watch to track, cycling indoors. Now this involves very little movement or tension on my arms and should therefore produce less noise. Here we see an overview of that accuracy. Each dot here is a single heart rate measurement with along the horizontal axis the value according to the Polar H10 ECG chest strap and on the vertical axis the value according to the Epix 2. There's a pretty good agreement between the ECG chest strap and the Apex 2 as most points are along the blue line. However, there are still a few points away from the blue line, both above it and below it, indicating it detected both a too high and too low heart rate. Looking at this first spinning session, we see that overall there's a pretty good agreement. Along the horizontal axis, we have the time and my heart rate is along the vertical axis. In blue, I plotted my heart rate according to the Polar H10 ECG chest strap and in red is my heart rate according to the Apex 2. 
As you can see, mostly there's a good agreement, though sometimes there's a slight delay in the Epix 2 picking up changes in my heart rate. As you can see, for instance, here, here, and here. In this second spinning session, the delays in it picking up my decreases in heart rate were a bit bigger, as you can see, for instance, here, here, but also here. However, overall, the results are not bad, as you can see, for instance, also in this training session. All in all, this is still not bad compared to many other devices. However, there are definitely a few better devices out there. Next, let's take a look at cycling outside, for which the overview is displayed here. Generally, this is more difficult for most watches since there's much more movement and bumpiness. As you can see, this doesn't look bad overall, though there are definitely moments of deviation, especially with the Epix 2 detecting a too low heart rate. Looking at the individual rides, this becomes even clearer. Some rides are really good, where the Epix 2 is able to follow along with the chest strap almost perfectly, and that's what we see here in this example. We see mostly the same thing for this ride right here. However, for some rides, this is much worse, like for this ride right here, where we see quite a big deviation. And also for this ride right here in the beginning. Overall, the ratio of very good rides to mediocre or bad rides is about 50-50 based on my testing. These results are not amazing, so this is definitely something to keep in mind when using the Epix 2 for cycling. It appears to be a bit hit and miss if it can follow my heart rate accurately. Next, let's take a look at weightlifting. Now, this is generally more difficult for watches given the tension on my wrist and arms. And indeed, we see a familiar pattern we've seen for many watches. The Epix 2 can track my heart rate in between sets, but the moment I start a set, it cannot keep up with the peaks in my heart rate. We mostly see the same thing for this second weightlifting session, though a few peaks were now captured by the Epix 2. Overall, though, I would not recommend the Epix 2 as a heart rate monitor during weightlifting. I actually also wore the Phoenix 7 at the same time but on the other arm. So let's see how this performed in comparison to the Epix 2. Let's start with cycling indoors. On the left are the results for the Epix 2 and on the right the results for the Phoenix 7. Now I limited myself to just those exercises where I was wearing both devices at the same time. As you can see the results look very similar for both devices and they perform about equally well for spinning. Next, looking at cycling outside, this also looks very similar for both devices. The Phoenix 7 actually seems to perform quite a bit worse during this test compared to the test I did a few weeks back, which I cannot really explain. I always wear the watches well away from the wrist bone and quite tight, and I did not change anything about that part of the procedure. Interestingly, if we plot the individual rides, the two watches do not always show their mistakes at the same moment. Here I plotted the ECG chest strap in red, the Epix 2 in blue and the Phoenix 7 in green. And as you can see here in the beginning, the Epix 2 followed along quite well, but the Phoenix 7 struggled. However, during this other ride right here, it was the Phoenix 7 that did quite well here in green and the Epix 2 in blue struggled a bit more. Finally, for weightlifting, we also see more or less the same result for the Epix 2 and the Phoenix 7. As you can see, both watches were not able to pick up on the peaks in my heart rate during each of the sets that I did. Whereas heart rate is generally measured using green light, red and infrared light are used to measure your oxygen saturation. Over the last week, I measured my oxygen saturation at ground level in the morning and evening using the Epix 2 and Phoenix 7. At the same time, I also recorded my oxygen saturation using a dedicated finger pulse oximeter. At ground level, my oxygen saturation should be within my normal range, which is generally between 97 and 100%, and it should not fall below roughly 95%. On the left are 27 measurements taken with the Epix 2 and on the right the measurements taken with the finger pulse oximeter. As you can see, the Epix 2 quite often measures quite low SpO2 values. I'm honestly not sure why this is, but this does mean you might need to be more careful when you do get a low SpO2 measurements not to read into it too much. Just for reference, here are the results of the measurements taken with the Phoenix 7 over the last week. Interestingly, a much larger percentage of the measurements is in the normal range for the Phoenix 7. Now, I cannot really explain this difference since it has an almost identical design to the Epix 2. Overall, when I likely had normal SpO2 values, the Epix 2 reported quite a few low measurements. This means that at least for me, the measurements of the Epix 2 do not appear to be super reliable. What about GPS tracking? I tested that while cycling to and from work, and I wanted to test two things. One, how long does it take for the watch to get a GPS signal? And two, how well do GPS signals overlap when cycling the same route multiple times? That is displayed here for four times I cycled to work. I started the activity the moment I was ready to leave and I did not provide the watch with any extra time to acquire the signal. The green marker indicates the moment it connected to the GPS signal and as you can see it almost always acquired the signal almost instantly, which is good. It needs a few seconds to get a more accurate location but it quickly locks on. If we look at the actual agreement between the signals this is pretty good for the most part. Though there are some moments where they deviate a bit more. All in all, they're generally very consistent, which seems to be in line with what we previously saw for the Phoenix 7. And we see the same thing for cycling back. The signal is acquired quite quickly. 
and the agreement between the four different signals appears to be really good. As you can also see here for instance, there are some moments with a bit more deviation. However, overall it looks really good and the GPS tracking is amongst the best of the devices I've tested so far. I'm pretty impressed with the GPS tracking of the Epix 2, but again this is not unexpected given that we saw the same thing for the Phoenix 7. However, what is still really weird is that the sleep tracking of the Epix 2 and Phoenix 7 appears to be so much worse than that of the Garmin VivoMove Sport in my testing. I actually connected the Epix 2 to the same account that the VivoMove Sport was connected to before. This was to make sure it wasn't due to the special settings on that account or due to the fact that the sleep tracking algorithm might have more or better data on that account. However, it did not make any difference at all. In the in the comments some people speculated that Garmin indeed is testing a newer algorithm on the VivoMove Sport, however I couldn't find any references to this online so this is speculation for now. So it might indeed be that firmware updates still bring improvements to the Epix 2. For most of my testing the firmware was at 7.20 but for the final workouts and night this was updated to 7.24. However on this very limited data set I did not see clear improvements. So who's the Epix 2 for? Well I still think that the battery life and the maps are the main selling point for this watch. If you like to go on long hikes or ski trips or go camping a lot without the possibility of charging a smartwatch this could definitely suit you. Now which should you choose in that case the Epix 2 or Phoenix 7? Well the user experience of the Epix 2 was significantly better for me than with the Phoenix 7. It's just so much nicer to have a clear bright and responsive screen though the battery life does suffer a bit. Personally, I would go for the Epix 2 if I had to choose between these two. Regardless of which device you choose, I'd recommend connecting an ECG chest strap if you want to track your heart rate during exercise. However, I do feel that for most people, other watches, both from Garmin and other brands, are likely a better option. Other Garmin watches have many of the same health features and have similar or the same sensors at a much lower cost. The Garmin Venue 2 did quite well in my heart rate testing for instance, and last week we saw that the VivoMove Sport appears to be better at sleep tracking. Both of these devices are much cheaper than the Epix 2 and I'll link those videos up here. Though, as was pointed out correctly by some of my subscribers, there are some features more geared towards endurance sports having to do for instance with performance analysis and training load that might not be available on all Garmin watches. Now as a smartwatch and heart rate tracker, the Apple Watch is definitely much better than the Apex 2, but keep in mind that the battery life is not very good and that you need an iPhone. Check out those videos right here. The Huawei Watch GT3 also has a great heart rate tracker and is about a third of the price of the Apex 2 and that video is linked here. So whilst there's definitely a group of people for which the Epix 2 and Phoenix 7 are the best choice, I'd really recommend you consider if the features it adds are worth the higher prices. Now I hope this video provided you with some value. Thank you so much for watching and catch you in the next video.